Welcome on, welcome all guys. My name is Daniel Shake and I am a meteorite classifier. And today we're going to go over the first classification that I'd like to talk about, which is NWA12534. This is an LL7S3W3. All right, let's get into it. So here's the meteorical bulletin form. And as you can see, it's got quite a lot of information, but let's focus on what's important here. And so let's first talk about the history. All right, so this is the this is basically uh, the sample up there. And as you can see, these are three images of the sample. And so I had a collector who had some sort of, uh, you know, supposed Martian meteorite that he wanted me to classify. And he said it was some supposed Chassignite. So I take a look at it. As you can see, uh, you know, in chondrites, right away, the first indicator are these chondrules, which are these sublimiter sized, once molten igneous spherules. And so, you know, if you see these, you know, right away, hey, this is a chondrite of some kind. But you see here, it's, first off, it's, it's moderately, well, that's kind of putting it lightly, it's moderately to heavily weathered. And so, taking a look at this and trying to discern whether there's chondros or not in the sample was not that easy. And so, just from this alone, I couldn't really tell. And if you really look at the image on the right, you can see that it doesn't really have this chondritic texture to it. It looks kind of uh, a little bit achondritic. So, I just told the collector, send me the sample and I'll, you know, get a thin section made. And so here's what a polished uh, section looks like. This isn't the thin section, but this is just a polished section. And so you notice, of course, it's moderately weathered. That's to put it lightly, but it's brecciated. You can see there's different class. There's this rectangular class in the lower right, and then there's this elliptical class in the upper left. And basically something else I noticed was that I didn't really see any chondrules that were present, so that was something interesting. You know, I, I thought, you know, maybe if I saw chondrules, I'd know right away, hey, you know, it's ordinary chondrite or something, but I didn't really see those. And even in, you know, in heavily recrystallized, you know, type sixes, you still see some chondrules present, or at least, you know, you see the mainly blurring with the matrix, but you at least see that sort of thing. So I was seeing something very brecciated. I didn't see any chondrules at all. So I was a little bit skeptical at first, you know, is this really an ordinary chondrite? You know, he said it was some Martian Chassignite apparently, but I don't know. So I wasn't really too sure exactly on what this was. So, you know, the next thing to do was to get data. So I, you know, I, I sent in the slice to get a thin section made and that took about six weeks. And so during that time, I did two things. I sent a small piece to UNM to get oxygen isotopes, just in case, because if this was some achondrite, if it was something, you know, I wanted to have the isotopes, but looking back, it was probably better I did the probe work first uh, for two things. One, oxygen isotopes are expensive. I'm not gonna go into the cost, but it was kind of pricey. And two, uh, you know, doing the probe work on this, and even a lot of achondrites, you can sort of tell what they are. and. Sometimes you don't even need oxygen isotopes for some of those. So, you know, uh, it was kind of a hindsight 2020, but hey, you know, on the bright side, oxygen isotopes do confirm a lot of the time what the meteorite is. So anyways, let's go into the probe work. So first I got an SEM image under backscatter uh, electron uh, imaging. And basically uh, there's an assortment of different phases here and they're all, you know, you can see them all based on high Z contrast. So we've got olivine, low calcium pyroxene, high calcium pyroxene, plagioclase, troilite, and chromite. Troilite is the lightest phase here. You can see it's kind of scattered throughout the sample. Chromite is not as present as much as troilite, but there's still some chromite there. Plagioclase is the dark phase, and then olivine, low calcium pyroxene, and high calcium pyroxene are sort of the intermediate grayscale phases, with olivine being the lightest and low calcium pyroxene being a little darker than that, and high calcium pyroxene somewhere in the middle. All right, so here are just some images. Uh, you can see these are big grains. So, you know, these are decent grains uh, for the grain size. So I think it's at least 50 microns, something like that. And um, something else you'll notice is that you can see sort of these triple junctions existing between these silicate grains. And so when you see these, you know, this is one indicator that you've got extensive uh, thermal metamorphism going on. And so at first I didn't really see these because I was already, I didn't really eye myself on thermal metamorphism being the dominant feature here because I didn't associate these things as being chondrites. I thought these were some sort of a chondrite potentially or something. 
So when I finally looked back after I got the oxygen isotope data and the probe data, that's when I started seeing these triple junctions. So, you know, had I identified them earlier, probably would have, you know, been easier to do the further identification. But, you know, that's what the probe work does. So, and these are just more photos. And as you can see on the image on the right, you'll see this, uh, what looks to be, actually kind of does look interesting when you think about it, but basically this is a po example of a poikiloblastic, poikiloblastic texture. And so basically you've got olivine that's surrounded by low calcium pyroxene. And incidentally, this looks sort of a little bit like a chondral. It's got a little bit of the shape, but it's not a chondral. It's something completely different. So what's going on here? Hmm. And so here I've put together this little compilement. So I've got the phases labeled here of why I call this a type seven instead of calling it a type six, because some, some uh, meteorists argue that type sevens have experienced partial melting and, and such. But in this sample right here, from what I'm saying, this texture is not poikilitic. So it's not a igneous texture. This is a metamorphic poikiloblastic texture. And so the olivine here surrounded by low calcium pyroxene is basically what you got going on here. And you've got these triple junctions that are existing. So you've got the triple junctions between the grains. And this basically, I'd say, is a good example of a remnant chondral. So you've had initially a chondral at first, and then you've had extensive thermal metamorphism, and then you just develop this poikilobastic texture. So the pyroxenes actually grew due to this extreme metamorphism. These large poikilobastic pyroxenes that surround the olivine, they grew due to that crystallization from metamorphism and also you'll notice that what I've added to it is that the CAO is basically greater than one weight percent in these low calcium pyroxenes which is a good example of it being more of a type 7 than a type 6 and so if we take a look at the data here we'll see again uh, if we take a look at the here we go if you take a look at the two charts on the right so if you ignore the data for now you'll see that the phaolite of the olivine and the phosphate of low calcium pyroxene plot it right in the LL field. And you see it on both charts here, the standard deviation of the phaolite with the phaolite content just shows that it's very equilibrated throughout the whole thing. And it's an LL. So we know it's heavily equilibrated. It's an LL. I was giving you reasons why I believe it should be a type seven and why it was approved as a type seven. And basically another thing you see is take a look at the uh, ferrocellite, sorry, the last night content of low calcium pyroxene is about 2.9. That's a little higher than normal for a type six. I'd say for a type six, you're about maybe, mm, I'd say probably for an LL, probably 1.9, somewhere around there, but 2.9, that's higher than normal. And if we take a look at the last night for the high calcium pyroxene, 41.9, little bit lower than normal, even with the standard deviation, I guess you can add that to 42, but I'm normally accustomed to 43 to 44 at least, something like that. So you've got basically what it looks to be is that you've got higher calcium in the low calcium pyroxene and lower calcium in the high calcium pyroxene, which is a good example of a type 7 over a type 6. So that's another example. The plagioclase uh, 10.3, I mean, that's close to the 11, anorthite 11 equilibration mark, where you've got sort of the maximum amount of plagioclase that's equilibrated, which is pretty much found in type sixes and up. So we know this is definitely at least the, you know, a type six, to type seven plus. So, but basically everything else sort of indicated that this is a type seven. And lastly, here are the auction isotopes. I got the results for them and look at that. It's an LL. <laughs> it's not like we didn't know that from the probe data, but, you know, oxygen isotopes confirm it. So basically this sample is an LL7, and if I wanted to do future work on this sample, I'd probably try to maybe look at these clasts carefully, because when I was sort of getting the data, I sort of got points from all around the sample. I didn't really focus on different clasts. And so if I would go back, I would definitely want to take a look at that rectangular clast, and get compositions of that, probably get more counting times too, and try to get better resolution on certain elements, uh, probably the chromium, the olivines, and maybe some other things, uh, and the pyroxenes. And then also another thing I would potentially do is uh, probably try to understand more of its history regarding its formation, because from, from what I'm getting is that you had all these, you had the formation. So you had the formation of the sample, so basically you had all these 
impacts on the parent body. And then you basically accumulated some of these different fragments together. And so you got this, you know, this breccia essentially that formed. And then after that, you basically had thermal metamorphism sort of homogenize all the compositions within the different uh, lithologies. And then you basically just metamorphose the entire thing. Because basically, when I got points from all around the sample, they were all pretty much identical for the olivines and the pyroxenes. So that's sort of my interpretation on how this uh, meteorite most likely came to be. So anyways, uh, that's sort of just 